Is it a question? Oh, no, that's that would be very hard. <laughs> Uh, hello, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you for the last talk of this semester. Um, we are very happy to welcome Giacomo De Giorgi from the University of Geneva as our speaker today. Uh, the Leoit, uh, now you must be familiar, it's an hour, including 15 minutes Q&A at the end, uh, where I will open the mic uh, for selected question to ask their part uh, to for selected participant to ask their question live. Um, we have Davide Pietro Bon, who is uh, uh, the co-author on this paper that is going to help uh, answering the question on uh, the Q&A section. Uh, but I'll make a couple of posts to see uh, if uh, to pass on clarifying question to the speaker. Uh, and um, uh, needless to say that uh, any aggressive or abusive behavior is not going to be tolerated. Uh, and uh, on this note, I'm going to give the mic to Giacomo. Uh, please go ahead. Thanks, parents. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll get started. Um, this is a paper on essentially occupational sectoral choices um, under incomplete markets. Um, one of the co is there as a panelist, David, and maybe Salvi is also in the audience. Um, uh, so, David, by the way, look look out for David because it's going to be on the market next year. So, what do we start with here? Well, the idea is that we there's a sort of common narrative that suggests um, like non farming enterprises, non farming activities are typical uh, activities that are the result of the lack of insurance. So, more like necessity than really you know trying out skills. And the World Bank sort of puts this into the wisdom number 15, um, and it's sort of factish. So we've got to be investigating this and see whether you know this is important. One way to investigate this is essentially look at data directly. And then directly in the data in the U U Ethiopian Rural Also Survey, we found, I apologize, um, this particular um, set of items of what are the reasons for starting a non-farming enterprise or non-farming activity. And in fact, limited agricultural income seems to be one of the leading uh, reasons for why people start this type of activities. Uh, this is actually common in other data sets. This is the one that looked the better. Uh, and in general, we want to try to answer the question whether you know there are so many entrepreneurs out there, why are they there? Um, whether migration is an income model device, other people, of course, have looked into this. Um, and we know this actually offers diversification opportunities. In economies with incomplete markets, which I guess characterize most of the economies we sort of care about in this seminar in general. Um, now, this has, of course, you know, if people use this type of income smoothing devices, this has implication for resource allocation. Uh, and a sort of complementary point was made that the availability of insurance also allow for more um, access to risk and in, in shifting risks uh, type of idea, like ARO 71 type of idea. Uh, we're not covering that part. That's a complementary part to what we're doing. Um, now, a follow-up question for us is that, you know, if necessity entrepreneurship is so important, then this has some potential implication for the structural transformation and the movement from farming to non-farming activities. And this is related to the literature of structural transformation, which you probably know more than I do, you know, Lagacos and Vogue, Golin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, what do we do in this project? Uh, we build an estimated partial equilibrium model of incomplete markets uh, with heterogeneous households that are in, heterogeneous in terms of land and exposed in skills. And they sort of make sectoral occupational choices and they decide, you know, whether, you know, how much to work in the farm, uh, whether to have any non-farming enterprises um, and how much to work on that. And a temporary migration, there's going to be a discrete choice. Uh, and that's very similar to what uh, Melanie Morton has in her paper and we call others. Um, of course, the occupational choice model, I mean, you know, you're all familiar with Roy model, Banerjee and Newman, Lucas, et cetera, et cetera. You know, some of these models have to do more with skills than 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 than, than anything else. And so this, everything's hinges upon credit constraints uh, where, you know, skills don't go where they're supposed to go because of credit constraints. We have a sort of different attack to this problem. 
And we have an attack that is actually about mostly about uh, in marketing competence in the insurance market. Now, given that we start from a proposition that market are incomplete, it's lower agricultural productivity, so worse rainfall essentially. We lower farm labor uh, and we'll sort of push people towards operating uh, and allocate time to non-farming enterprises and potentially spend more time sending migrants out. Now, we're gonna sort of also propose some counterfactuals. Some of them are because of um, the idea of benchmarking what we get. And so that would be a, let's say complete non-farming enterprise market. It's not exactly a complete market, but it, it will be clear later on. And we propose a couple of weather insurance devices that are somewhat very stylized, but maybe interesting to, to, to look at. And of course, there's a lot of work that's related to this, the, you know, works on comparative advantages uh, and, you know, work on con income and consumption smoothing and insurance. And I guess I don't need to actually point towards this work because most of you are very familiar with it. Now, what do we, how do we do this? We essentially use exogenous variation. Um, Household level rainfall, I'll get back to that. It's, I think it's an important part, but, but uh, you know, we can also use standard village level variation as measured in, in the EQSAT data. Uh, we use about five waves of the EQSAT data. Uh, I'll describe that. These are data that other people have used, including actually David has a, a very nice paper just came out in the JD um, a few months ago that uses the same data. Now, the idea on the household specific uh, rainfall is because uh, the same amount of rainfall at the village level has very different uh, uh, um, importance in productivity in the different plots because plots differ by many characteristics, including depth, including slope, including the type of soil, and so on and so forth. So we'll use those type of ideas uh, later on in the paper. And, and we show that uh, the incompleteness of the market will drive the occupational choices across the, you know, the non-farming enterprise and migration and, and farming enterprise. Um, I should point out here, and maybe we get back to this very, very late, that the results are, this actually has been a long paper, so it's been a long time coming. Um, and one of the reasons that we actually wanted to see where the results were not just a fluke in a specific data set, but in many other data sets. And it turns out that at least in the radius form, we confirm all the results in you know many different countries in different setup. So it seems to be a more like a general point rather than a very specific one, which I think is nice. Now, I'm gonna give you a preview of the results very, very quickly. Um, in the reduced form, essentially what we see is that negative agricultural productivity shock, so essentially low rainfall. We lower their farming hours, uh, we'll increase NFE participation and hours, uh, and we'll increase the probability of sending migrants. So this is very consistent, also the migration results is very consistent with uh, Melanie's paper. Um, Something I'm not going to get into today very much is uh, the compliance. So those people who actually do the shift seem to be, you know, where good farmers are not very good entrepreneurs. And that's because uh, of the way they make the shift. Um, now, this is probably a very general point I want to make now. Uh, um, we are modeling interconnected choice. So, you know, essentially we have a shock that will impact the occupational choices because these are, you know, interior choice essentially uh, and intensive margin mostly and so all the mechanisms of play would be very hard to pin down I think in a reduced form and that's one of the reasons why we build the model around this um, there are many other reasons this is actually allows us to discipline our thoughts um, also one point that is important here to, to remind um, is that um, the marginal of consumption plays an important role in incomplete markets and this is very related to Donovan's paper um, and that's because, you know, in, in this model, uh, it is informing in the sense that we provide the mapping between the rainfall shocks and the different choices. And that a lot of it actually boils down to the essentially majority of consumption playing an important role in the first order conditions and the and sectoral and choice allocation. Um, now, what we find in the end is that the uh, non-farming enterprise, so um, let's say entrepreneurs are found along the distribution of land and skills, and there are too many of them. And they're actually not pushing up the level of skills overall. Um, when presented with insurance forms, like weather insurance forms, these issues are alleviated. So there's, you know, fewer NFE and uh, better, um, but it's not anywhere near com market completeness. So where do we go from here? I'm gonna present a few simple facts, uh, start the building blocks of the model uh, uh, in a graphical sense, hopefully that be easy to follow. Um, and then project present some reduced form and structural evidence, uh, provide some counterfactual and essentially conclude with some remarks. 
Um, it is still pretty much like, you know, things that we are actually do going, doing now, the, the estimation of this takes a bit of a t some time. <laughs> uh, so it's not very full right now, but now here in this diagram, what we are showing is essentially the, um, on the horizontal axis, you have the rainfall index, which I will describe later on, and the agricultural yields, uh, as you expect somewhat, the um, relationship is positive. And this actually is taken from the data where we collapse everything at the village level. So there are 18 villages in the, the Zigri set. Uh, here, villages are actually collapsed here into just one observation per village. Similar uh, type of diagram, but now we connect household uh, rainfall index to um, hours of work uh, in the non-farming enterprises and you see it's negative so the more it rains the less you work in a non-farming enterprise um the same type of idea applies to whether you start or not whether you're actually a non-farming enterprise or not so the extensive margin it's a negative relationship again and uh same with migration this actually is essentially the graph that uh, melanie has in her jp paper um we just uh, i mean the horizontal axis is different but the, the, the graph is essentially the same so where do we go from here? Well, let's try if we can build a model that actually sort of, you know, it's helpful in understanding all these facts. Um, and so this model, uh, I'm going to attempt to have a graphical representation of the model. So there's a household that is endowed with some skills and some land. And the rain comes, rain is going to be pi, and that's why the cloud, the Greek cloud. Um, and then, you know, they have to decide where to do farming and how much of it. And this is essentially the farming production function it's a you know it's like so land augmenting in the sense of Rosenzweig type of thing it's, a, it's one production function is one possibility of course it has you know implication and everything uh but this is the one we're working on with right now uh I'm going to explain a little bit more of this um but essentially you know h is going to be the number of hours into farming l is land pi is rain and this uh capital tau or capital t is the tfp in in farming activities and, you know, doing some farming hours implies some utility cost that is going to be called kappa. Now, you can also decide to migrate. Uh, and migration essentially brings you a wage. This is going to be just a wage W that we see in real estimate in the model. And this will increase the cost of effort, the utility cost of effort into farming and non-farming enterprise. This, the idea is here that if you have one of your family members migrating, then, you know, you have to work harder, essentially. And that, you know, sort of, you know, imposes more cost. And now there's also the other option that is actually a non-farming enterprise option where we're going to have a production function here. It's very similar to the one uh, in the land, but epsilon here is stochastic. So it's like there's some stochasticity in the productivity, let's say, of your skills as in this sector. And to set up, and we go back to set, to set up your enterprise, you need to pay some utility cost, the other. And of course, there's some cost of effort. So hours of work in the non-farming enterprise will come with some cost of effort, kappa E. Now, if you are still working on your non-farming enterprise um, in the next period, your skills will increase. It's like a you know a tenure profile of idea. It's learning, and your skill will increase at a, an exogenous rate of one, essentially. Uh, that's what we are hypothesizing the model, and with some probability, phi, you will um, your 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 firm will be destroyed. And so there's some exogenous separation rate. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have some sort of strange implication. Now, there's a, another twist that is the following. In order to start a non-farming enterprise, you need to own enough land so that you're not land constrained. What does it mean? Well, that's essentially the part of credit constraint we are entering in as if you were, you know, we're able to use part of your land to finance the initial uh, part of building up a business. Um, this is the you know the graphic representation of the model where in essence the household is you know waiting for the rain the rain comes is good bad and then the choices are made um, and this will produce an allocation uh, of hours at intensive margin and whether you start or not a non farming enterprise uh, at the intensive margin whether you migrate at, uh, sorry at the extensive margin whether you migrate or not at, at extensive margin um, now more um, formally. Um, we're going to write a consumption problem, let's say. So consumption uh, comes with a budget constraint, of course, where you know you consume um, your farming income, non-farming income, and uh, the wage out of migration in case you have migration equal to one. Um, 
what happens here is that we're going to be maximizing this under the you know, standard cross natural discovery function with raw discovery taken then from the literature, let's say, to two. Um, the standard problem in this sense, uh, the maybe the only like strange part here is that we're going to have discrete and continuous charges. So continuous in the hours of work in farming and non-farming enterprise and uh, discrete in terms of migration. Uh, this is because of uh, the data uh, we've been using and we could actually now realize, realize that actually can improve on this. Um, now, the first other conditions are important just because they are sort of highlight uh, um, the, the role of the marginal material consumption here, because they're going to show up essentially in the, on the left hand side of the expression for the uh, optimal farming effort and the non farming effort. Uh, clearly, you know, it's just the equalization will give us the result that uh, we'll be developing in the model later on. Now, what we expect in a comparative static sense is that if it rains more, the marginal product of farming hours increases, and the expected marginal benefit of NF, uh, non farming hours will decrease. And despite the benefit of migration will decrease because essentially now you have a, you know this increase in productivity in the in the farming sector. This relies upon the fact that you need enough uh, of uh, super modularity uh, in in the problem to to get the results that to get this type of results. And so this will imply that the expected marginal benefit of effort increases. Therefore, number of hours the hours of farming will increase. Um, I think this is a good time to pause. Maybe if there are any any questions. Uh, I realize that I'm going fast. Um, uh, there was a question on uh, using the timing of the rainfall, uh, where as opposed to using the annual, um, as yeah. opposed to using the annual data. Yeah. So let me sort of, <laughs> so we have tried many, many, many things, including the timing, yearly, et cetera, et cetera. Today, I'm going to use rainfall in the year essentially uh we have done it with like different season different part of india I, I think the whole thing that goes through uh i i you know, just went for the simplest possible thing of course the probably thing to do would be to use rainfall at the right timing uh and uh, the right timing is you know somewhat known but somewhat also controversial we went we tried all possible things um and we spent a lot of time actually on this so yeah so it's it's a very appropriate question and uh we you know in fact we have discussed this today again um now yeah um so the data we use are the exact data that many people have used in the past uh, as i mentioned you know this you know david has a paper using those data but these are you know the follow-up of the townsend paper you know there's like plenty of people use this paper uh this, this data uh so uh, and i sort of started to appreciate them very much because of the richness of the data in terms of how much you know about the households as well as the plots as well as the rain as well as the uh, uh, activities etc cetera, etc cetera. we'll get back to that but you know it, it has been like in, very uh, um, uh, exciting for me to actually look into this particular data, which I never used before. Um, now, the data essentially cover 18 villages, and uh, there, we have five waves that we're using uh, from July 2010 to June 2014. We aggregate everything from the monthly to the yearly frequencies, and we essentially take from the individual level to the household level. So we're not really looking into the, into the different members of the households. We're just thinking about this as a household problem. Um, uh, and I think you know the model is already complicated enough. It is. Uh, I, I don't know whether we can push this any farther. Um, now, what do we have in the data? It's essentially you know here's a bunch of statistics on the main variables that we're going to be ending up using. Um, one important thing that we'll, um, we'll we'll discuss a little bit is the effective rain measurement in terms of depth and rent. Um, turn out that actually they're very correlated with each other. Um, Land size is, you know, very standard for these um, economies, and the uh, share of uh, NFE non farming enterprise is about sixty percent. Um, about sixteen percent of the households send a migrant um, or more, and then we use a lot of the adult equivalent scaling. That's the same one that Townsend used. Uh, we haven't we haven't probed much that one, but uh, yeah, it's just one way of thinking about the uh, household problem, just shrinking it to some sort of um, adult equivalent measurement. Now, what is maybe relevant here is that in the main outcomes that, and especially like in the non-farming enterprise and migration, so these things are 
these numbers are not very far from, especially for non-farming enterprise, actually, I should say, from the same statistics from the, you know, the LSMS, as well as the uh, Ethiopian uh, rural household that we were using at the beginning. Um, so it's not like that there are so many fewer, many more um, entrepreneurs in this, in, in this world. What is entrepreneur here? I'm going to get back to that, of course, because it's, it's a big question, I think, in general. Um, now, this is what I want to spend a little, maybe a little second or two. So we're going to be using, we've used actually in the, you know, in the analysis, like a couple of measurements of, rain, of, of rainfall, effective rainfall. Uh, we also use village level rainfall. Um, now, one relies upon soil debt, and soil seems to be quite important in essentially in determining productivity once it rains. Um, very shallow soils are not very good uh, uh, for this, and there's all literature on this, so I'm not the world expert on this specific, uh, I, although, you know, <laughs> we always joke that, you know, David has a farm and I have a farm, so, but, uh, but we're not like the world expert uh, on this. Um, so... Depth matters, and depth is different actually even within the village, differs quite a bit across the different plots. And so we use this idea to think that uh, really rainfall uh, is not what it falls at the village level, but you know it, it is mediated by characteristics of the plot. In fact, there's actually heterogeneity even within uh, villages, I think, um, but in terms of rainfall per se. But, but you know, all of it is due to the quality of the soil, the type of soil. So we use soil depth as essentially one mediator that transfers the rain, rainfall into productivity. Um, the other way we think about this is that we can actually use many more characteristics of the plot, including the type of soil, the slope of the soil, whether it's actually, uh, it has some enclosure or not, all of that to define the value also of, the, of the productivity of the plot, which we, you know, impute into the rental value. So we have a rental value, but we have a bunch of characteristics of the soil. We can actually take the predicted value of rent, given the characteristics of the of the of the of the plot, and use that as a measure of productivity, which can then, then interact with rainfall at the village level. This gives us you know variation at the household level because of the diversity of plots that people have. These are typically inherited, so the usual caveat applies that in the way a very developed. Uh, land market, this would be very endogenous, but it doesn't seem to be the case. Um, in any case, we can also use the like, standard village level rainfall uh, and everything goes through. Uh, what is somewhat interesting, but maybe not very interesting, I'm going to attempt to do this, is there a correlation between the rain debt and the rain uh, 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 measured as a rent? Essentially, is 0.97. So there is no difference between the two. Um, so we can use both and we, I'll show you both, but it doesn't matter. Um, now these are, you know, graphs that David doesn't like very much, but I and, and maybe Salva doesn't like either. But I love them because they're reminiscent of Townsend '94. So this basically is the variation the mean from the village level. Our measure of effective rainfall is the depth one. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the household, and then on the um, so on the x-axis, on the y-axis, you have the, the the different waves, and then you know the measurement of the effective rainfall, which you know the scale doesn't really tell you much here. Uh, gives you a sense of the variation in a cross section that you can see as uh, on the x-axis. So there's a lot of variation. These are the original Orepale, Shirapur, and Kanzara villages of the 94 paper. So there's a lot of variation in this. So within village, there's a lot of variation because these are the means. Um, and if you look at dispersion of soil, there's a lot of dispersion of soil as well. Uh, and maybe I'm not going to attempt to do this uh, back and forth again. Um, now, one important thing to define here is, of course, is, um, oops, sorry about that, uh, is what is an entrepreneur here? What is a non-farming enterprise? Uh, we essentially look at all income generating activities in the data and we, you know, we, we didn't really select much because this is what looks like a non-farming enterprise to us in the, in the data. And so this could be, you know, from goldsmith to uh, washerman to barber to selling goods, machinery yard out and so on and so forth. Of course, uh, this is the type of non-farming activities that go on in, in many developing countries. This is not very different from what we had actually in uh, in Ethiopia and not very different from what we had in the SMS, although the definitions there were a little bit uh, fuzzier, I would say. Uh, this one uh, at least more uh, refined. And then we went, you know, in the other category, we had to actually go one by one in all the lines to figure out whether this seems like a business activity or not, which, you know, we try to sort of map uh, in a meaningful way. 
Now, in the reduced form, it's pretty straightforward what you do. Essentially, you have something that moves somewhat exogenous as effective rainfall, and you know, use that as the um, exogenous variation to estimate the effect of the shock on a series of um, facts, which are the ones that um, we, we saw before, essentially. So labor supply and, and you know, starting an NFE or managing an NFE and sending a migrants, productivity, and so on. We have uh, individual level fixed effect and uh, a wave a wave of time fixed effect, I guess. We can actually include um, village level rainfall and still uh, be able to estimate this. These are more like, you know, again, descriptive facts in a way. And so, of course, output increases as we have seen before with, uh, with rain. Um, like ultra output is actually in, in tons, I think. Um, the number of hours increase in reduced form um, in the last of 0.13. Uh, number of NFE hours falls. You know, uh, the more it rains, of course, the less you are sort of moving towards non-farming enterprise. You, you, you know, you farm more. That's that's what 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 really is this paper about. Uh, and the same applies to the extensive margin. So, you know, the more it rains, the less likely you are to have a non-farming enterprise. Uh, not surprising, I guess. And the effects we find are essentially very much the same. We, either we use that debt. Definition of the effective rain or the rental value of the effective rain, which I mean, by the way, people, uh, uh, you know, although there isn't really a very strong and large land market, which you know we are investigating right now, people seem to have a very good sense of what the rental value of a non-rented plot would be because it's actually pretty much correlated with you know the productivity of the plot. It, it, it's you know it's somewhat reassuring and that tells you something else that maybe it's interesting. Um, profits in NFU go down because we have you know. Uh, zeros and so on, uh, even if you have logging, you have log, log, logging one plus. And so and the only important part is that the more it rains, and this is again, you know, Melanie's result essentially, the less uh, people migrate. Uh, this is all temporary migration. So that's the way, that's the one we can identify in the data, I think. Um, now, these are all results that actually are pretty robust to a lot of things that we have done to the data. And so they, they come up this way in reduced form. It's, you know, the more it rains, the less, you do non-farming enterprise, um, the more you do agricultural like activities, um, the less you send migrants and so on. Um, there are other results that I'm not gonna talk too much about today, but I, I think it's worth pointing out because it's sort of that leading also the way we are thinking about the model. And so the effects of the shock seem to be more pronounced for the second and third quartile of the land distribution. So that means essentially that at the bottom of the land distribution with small land below, I think two acres we estimate, there isn't really much action going on. Uh, and this is compatible with the idea that we are imposing into the model that you know, there's a lower bound uh, to which uh, you can create a non-farming enterprise or not. What we see also is that uh, the people who actually move into NFEs because of shocks tend to be also persistent. So they're not just going to disappear tomorrow. And they're typically low, lower entrepreneurial quality of skills. And they come from a sort of decent part of the, of the farming distribution. Um, now, in, we move now into the more you know structural part of the paper, where essentially we are estimating uh, the model I described as I described graphically beforehand. Uh, hopefully that was somewhat useful and clear. Um, now we do this; we estimate this by using simulated middle moments and uh, a form of gradient annealing. Uh, Gradient-based methods are complicated here because of the discrete choice that we have in there. Uh, we could actually still do it, but it's very costly in terms of calculating the gradient. Uh, so we are doing this um, uh, as a simulated middle moments with the 3D annealing, and essentially we are minimizing, we're trying to get as close as possible to the empirical moments uh, through the simulated moments. So that's really a standard thing uh, that we are trying to do here. And there's a bunch of parameters we are trying to estimate. And so some of them will take them from, 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 from the literature, let's say. Some of them will internally estimate using the restrictions of the model. Um, now, we are definitely working with a skill distribution that is limited in terms of a lot of what I'm gonna show today is gonna be based on uh, upper level of skill that you can reach into non-farming enterprise equal to three. So you only have three levels, one, two, and three. And, and you know, at the moment we are running it with five, like full on with five full model and seems to be actually doing better in matching some of the moments. So, so we probably have to extend that, but it's very costly because it adds a bunch of uh, stuff to the state space. Um, we have a skill accumulation that should read one if you are keeping the, the, the non-farming enterprise. Next period, you're going to have one extra skill, and then you stop at three. 
Uh, beta is the usual 0.95, and uh, coefficient of relativity conversion is going to be two. Again, externally, you know, a lot of people have used two or similar numbers. We haven't played around with that that much. The rain and the distribution of rain, we take it from the data because we have it in the data. So we just take it from the data. And the same applies to land, uh, I, Li. Now, sigma, we can estimate internally because of the production function, the simple production function we have, we can actually estimate it directly, uh, uh, not having to do it into the, uh, the structural part, but we can actually estimate the equation directly. It boils down to have a, a, a sigma, um, so the CS part to be 0.54 and uh, productivity to be 0.18. These are somewhat meaningful, but but you know these are what they are given our data, and then we are going to have to essentially estimate the kappas. So there's two kappas: the utility cost of farming and uh, and, and non-farming enterprise labor, the delta. So and the, we're going to use migration rates for that because that's the extra cost imposed by migration into the utility cost of um, working in the farm and in, in enterprise. Yoda is the setup cost for um, the non-farming enterprise in case you don't have it. Uh, when you start that period. Gamma is going to be essentially the CS of the um, production function for uh, the non-farming enterprise. Uh, capital T E is, again, the productivity, the photo factor productivity of the uh, non-farming non enterprise business. Phi is the separation rate, which we are going to try to get at um, with um, you know, the rate of transition between NFE and NFE. L lower bar is the lower limit to starting up a non-farming enterprise. And we estimate that to be 1.96, so about two acres. So essentially we don't see people having non-farming enterprise below that land uh, size. Um, now, in the moment in search that we have, we we sort of, um, you know, we have um, somewhat guided our search because it's it's a very large search that you need to do around these parameters. At least for us, it, it, it you know, became like pretty large. And so we use uh, uh, moments that are sensible for us in order to pin down certain parameters, which gives a sense of what the, where the identification is coming from, by the way. Uh, and so, you know, in order to match the kappas, you sort of want to use the, the work hours and the output in the different sectors. Um, to match the separation rates or the, the phi, you want to use the transition between non-farming enterprise and non-farming enterprise, because that essentially pins down almost uh, you know, directly that one. So we did do a lot of this work, and um, we started from multiple places in the in the state space. At the moment, what that's essentially what the model is able to do. So it's matching pretty well some of the moments, uh, not all of them. Uh, I think it's right in the order of magnitude. We are matching actually with more skills. We are matching much better the average migration and the NFE binary as well. But these are not very far in that sense. Now there are certain moments that we actually know we're not going to be very good at matching, like the average average product in farm, and that's because of the way we actually have modeled it. Uh, but you know, in many respects, this does decently. And in fact, if we actually look at moments that we haven't used as targets, but you know, these are external to the model. So we uh, you know look at the correlation between um, rainfall and the NFE hours. It's in the empirical, they're all negatives actually in, in the in the in the in, in, in the data. In the simulator, they're actually negative as well. So in terms of uh, NFE hours, NFE binary, NFE migration. And in terms of the standard deviation of log hours in farming enterprise and the standard deviation of log consumption, we are not you know, right on top of it, but we're sort of not that far in a way. Uh, it's, you know, and I guess this will improve as we add a little bit of more uh, flavor, but these are not moments that we are targeting. So these are moments that are outside what we target. So this is, you know, consider, I think, a measure of goodness of fit of the model. Uh, I don't think it's exceptional, um, but it's not terrible either. Um, now, um, I, I can uh, maybe pause here, or I can go to the to the counterfactual exercise, whatever, Garance, whatever you think it's um, to preference. Uh, I think your quota is doing a great job at answering <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> the question in the chat, so. Okay. Uh, I think you can use this time and then I'll take some question. Like Sounds that. good. So, so what, why do we build this whole model? Well, first, as I mentioned before, uh, this is, it's, I think it's a pretty heavy machinery, um, but maybe it isn't for some people. It, it, to us, was a pretty heavy machinery. And um, the reason why we built this one is because of the interconnection between the different choices is actually going to be very hard. That's, I think, the most substantial reason. It's very hard to actually understand exactly what 
one specific exogenous variation will produce in terms of uh, allocation of choices. And so that actually, you know, this, this model helps us a lot in that. Um, but also because, you know, we want to sort of understand whether different policies can cl get closer to a complete market setup. And so the complete market setup, in our case, is not exactly a complete market setup, actually. We are going to ensure the shocks to productivity in the non-farming enterprise. Uh, that's the way we define it. It's not a, the exact definition of complete market, but sort of let, let's, you know, Let's be vague there. Um, so what we do is there, basically, we are ensuring that part. And now that is going to be our benchmark in terms of allocation and misallocation of uh, 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 of choices. And that allows us to say how far we are from the benchmark scenario. And then we'll also be um, proposing a couple of uh, weather insurance policies. These are very stylized, uh, uh, just, you know, um, just to be cautious on not overselling this. These are very stylized um, um, weather insurance policies. One is a more standard weather insurance policy where, you know, the trigger essentially is based uh, at the aggregate level. So it's the village level rainfall that will trigger the payment or not. It's closer to a lottery, let's say. And the second type of uh, insurance that we propose, it's uh, more linked to the actual um state contingency, so to the household level rainfall, effective rainfall. So it pays when the household, when the household is suffering from low rain, essentially. And so it's closer to uh, you know what you consider a state contingent insurance. Um, now, they're not very realistic because we give them for free uh, <laughs> uh, completely. Uh, and so that's probably not a very realistic part where you actually give it for free. Uh, of course, we, and we also assume that everyone takes it for free, uh, which may be more realistic. So in the complete market scenario, and you know, looking at these uh, heat maps, uh, I think it's useful to start from the complete market scenario because that gives you essentially the benchmark. And the, the level of hours is not a very interesting thing because of course there are many, you know, there are differences that are not very well understood in terms of level of hours. But what you see is that in the complete market scenario, the only thing that should matter for the amount of hours you spend in the farming and business is actually uh, land. That given the production function, we have land is what should drive the choices essentially there in the complete market scenario. In fact, you see that it becomes, uh, I don't know whether you can see the pointer, but let's say you can, um, uh, you know, it becomes darker as you move to the right. So as, as you move in the land allocation towards the right side of the distribution, these are actually the you know, land allocation size in, in, in the, sorry, the land distribution in, in the data. In the incomplete market scenario, so that this, this, the model that we've actually estimated before, that's not true, as you can see. I mean, there's um, you know, there's hours that are up and down, uh, um, somewhere, everywhere. Uh, and especially you see that for people with skill level that are you know very, very low skill levels on the vertical axis, they tend to exert the most number of hours. Uh and those skills are not skills in the farming business, as you might remember, the production function skills were only in the in, in the non-farming enterprise. So they shouldn't really matter as you know the complete market shows. And these are evidence of misallocation. Um, now, of course, those people are constrained their choices. So what you would call forced farmers, so the ones with very low level of skills and very, very low level of land, will only be able to do farming and migration in principle. And so they will actually put the most hours, and this is the bottom um, left uh, square, I guess. Now, you can do the same type of exercise between complete markets and incomplete markets for uh, non-farming enterprise hours. And here, what should matter is actually the level of skills. Uh, the land should not matter here, aside from the initial constraint where you have this uh, L underscore. So you know the L underscore basically means that you can't do any hours because you can't really start up a firm. And that's, you know, that doesn't depend on the completeness in this definition of the market in completeness, we could actually lift that and create a credit market for that. Um, you know, without a bunch of stuff, but that's um, we could do that. Uh, the number of hours in non farming enterprise increases as the skill increase, but it's not dependent on the land distribution, aside from again this constraint. Uh, but in a complete market, that's not true, right? Because essentially, this is a, an income smoothing device, so people are going to move out and going to do non farming enterprise even uh, at very low level of skills. Um, 
And if you look at migration in complete markets, in, in the model we you know we have, in complete markets, there will be no migration, essentially. Uh, uh, but in complete markets, there is migration, and there's migration along the distribution of, of skills and and land, uh, not everywhere. Uh, and again, there's not you know, there's no direct impact of skills or land into the migration, because the way we have modeled it is, shouldn't be that way. Uh, it's just because of a response to the shock. What else we can say? Well, this is when we actually allow a large number of skills at most to be 10. And we only did it for this exercise uh, because it was you know, too costly for us to do it for the entire model. But what this uh, uh, graph is telling you is that the skill accumulation is very is quite different between an incomplete market scenario and a complete market scenario. So in the complete market scenario, you end up much higher level of skills and then, or higher level of skills than you do in the incomplete market scenario. And that's again, a result of you know these choices that are made not in the, just as a response to shocks right then as an optimizing choice. <clears throat> in this sense, there is misallocation and also there is misallocation in the sense of an intensive margin. So along the land side distribution, people work essentially in the non-farming enterprise too many hours. They shouldn't because they shouldn't be the intensive margin related to the, the land size. It should be actually related to the skill. And, and you can see that if you benchmark against the complete market where you have you know just the horizontal line, the red one, uh, for very small land size, remember that there is essentially no uh, enterprise started. Uh, but you see that there's an increasing profile, or at least U shape. It should be actually increasing. It depends on the realization of the shocks here. Um, you see there's essentially too many hours done at the right side of the land side distribution, and that is really a result of the incompleteness of the market. And so there's more there's misallocation in this sense. Um, okay. So now we can also propose these two different contracts of insurance where you know someone is paid if the trigger at the village level is um, activated. So it's about 25% of the time. So one quarter probability, that's uh, more like a lottery. Or uh, if you have um, uh, your own level of effective rainfall falls below your own um, quarter, quartile of the distribution, first quartile of the distribution. So what does it really mean? I mean, this means that there is one type of contract, the more standard one, I'll say, the one that actually uses, for good reasons, <laughs> uses um, aggregate level rainfall. One reason is measurement. The other one is the usual problem that, you know, you, it, it's hard to ask someone, you know, how much it is rain and so on and so forth. Um, now, that type of contract, so the standard contract is more like a lottery. And that essentially means that households we respond to shocks more in that case because that is not really responsive to a shock. That in, that ensures it's not that it's contingent; uh, it's just an aggregate uh, level. So the more disanchored the um, individual or household level rainfall is from the village level, the more the choices will depart from each other because one is a pure lottery. Then at that point, you know, if they are completely uncorrelated, that's just a lottery. It pays. With uh, you know some probability 0.25, it gives you some money essentially. Um, a lot of this, of course, is actually uh, beneficial because uh, advantageous because you know you pay zero for it. Uh, that's the way we designed it. So we didn't design the take out. Right? It, it, again, it's, it's a stylized model, <clears throat> stylized counterfactual, I should say. Now we can see that the correlation between uh, rainfall and hours of work in enterprise or rainfall and uh, having an NFE, our correlation between rainfall and migration, so these are column one, two, and three in the table, are more negative in the standard model. That's again, you know, because of this feature that um, uh, a specific, this type of rainfall, standard rainfall insurance is really not a very much a state contingent. In this case, of course, given the way we have constructed it, there will be some, for sure, there's some non-trivial correlation between the, 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 you know, the rainfall at the village level and the rainfall at the household level. Uh, and if you look at the level of the correlation between skills and number of hours into, um, uh, this should be yeah, uh, farming, uh, the, the larger, I think it's non-farming actually, this is supposed to be E, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but that's fine. Um, now, this is what we, we you know, we, we sort of figure is evidence of misallocation as well, because you're responding more to a shock by taking uh, 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 income smoothing devices outside. Um, I think I'm about, I'm, I'm about done and I think I'm, uh, okay. Um, so 
you know, what we sort of try to do in this paper is to show that, uh, crucially, uh, non-farming enterprise, as well as temporary migration, but that's not us, it's been already done. Uh, you know, use, it sort of has this feature of being an exposed moving device, which, of course, in incomplete market will uh, uh, produce uh, quite a substantial amount of allocation, a much of allocation that, you know, we need to quantify it somewhat. Uh, there are certainly too many entrepreneurs in the wrong part of the uh, distribution uh, of land and skills. Um, uh, but also, you know, this gives us a sense that the income smoothing device uh, that people use may actually uh, sort of slow down the structural transformation in a way. So it sort of changed the way um, sectors are moving and evolving over time because they're not um, really filled in with um, the optimizing skill level agents that are actually going to move into non-farming enterprise, but there are going to be a lot of other uh, households and agents that actually are not supposed to do that uh, if they had complete markets. And it's probably not very surprising, but I think it's a very important result. Um, now, we provided a couple of counterfactuals uh, of interest. And um, you know, to us, these were somewhat interesting. They were maybe... Maybe the one part that's interesting about the 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 the, rain, the, um, the weather insurance counterfactual is that uh, you know thinking about the weather insurance counterfactual in a way as a lottery or as a you know state contingent type of contract, it's quite it's quite important for understanding also the transitions into the non-farming enterprise into migration. It's, it's not it's not that you you know by providing a lottery you actually are changing the problem fundamentally. It's 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 a, just a different device, uh, and it's not meant to actually prevent this movement from uh, this. Suboptimal, let's say, moment from from farming to non-farming enterprise. Um, I will, con I guess, yeah, I can conclude here. I can show you that this, essentially the all the first moment results in the reduced form all true, using different definition of shocks, different countries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I mean, hopefully you believe me, um, and uh, eventually we, you see that in the paper. Um, yeah, that's that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Giacomo. Uh, I'm going to start taking uh, some of the questions. Raise your hand if you have uh, uh, some questions. Um, uh, Sakina had a question that I think was related to, to something I was also wondering. You, you mentioned the role of land as if it's like uh, acting as a collateral, and this is what allows uh, uh, what allows uh, people to open non-farm enterprises. But maybe it could work differently. And Sakina had a suggestion. Can you speak, Sakina? Um, yeah, sure. Sorry, I just kind of had a question about how the definition that you guys are using for farm hours. So uh, um, when you guys are showing me the two graphs uh, that's showing the relationship between um, the the land size and the uh, allocation to um, non sorry non farm enterprises um, in complete and incomplete market, it kind of made me think about um, how well suppose there's a, a household with lots of land. Uh, and uh, it kind of like they they may not work that much on the land um, because they can also afford to have a you know non farm enterprise, but also hire uh, people on land. So I I wanted to um, ask uh, how you guys are defining number of hours works on on own farm. Thanks. Yeah. These are actually the number of hours are the total number of hours of each and every household member we can find uh, in the data. Um, we we're not modeling the you know the spot market for um, hiring workers. It seems to be a very hard problem per se. So we are not modeling that part. Um, in, I, I think there's, you know, there's, couple of, there's few papers that actually try to model that. There's a, there's a, these are in general, not incredibly large landowners. These are, you know, the very the usual like, said, villages. So I do not remember how many of these um, households will hire workers. I'm sure some do, uh, but it's not a part that we are modeling here. And the number of hours is, uh, you know, is within the household level number of hours. I think we sum them up in the household, for the household. We don't look at external hours and there's, one reason, I guess, is because they're not incredibly important. But the other is that I think that needs require a model for input that we we will have to add to this. Uh, you know, the decision to our workers comes with uh, some complications that are not very straightforward to solve. I think um, so. We are not modeling that part, but yeah, of course, it's, it's an important component. And uh, so we thought about this for a while, but but uh, we sort of stuck to this the simpler definition of hours of work. Um, just the household level of work. 
But yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, the, 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 <laughs> sorry, I did not mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I, that there was a second part of the question, which I think was related to you know this uh, lower bound to the number. So you need something to be able to build up. Uh, this seems to be sort of you know in, in the the data sort of tells you that there are no um, uh, non-farming enterprise actually started by people with no land, essentially with very little land. And that's what we match in the data. Um, so it's actually the data telling us that that's exactly what's happening. Both it actually in the reduced, I mean, it's just what they're telling us. But um, but yeah, but you can actually, you know, potentially think about, and that's another counterfactual we thought about lifting that constraint, right? So and see whether uh, with the credit market actually targets those people with uh, lower land, you have, uh, uh, you know, some sort of, um, well, you're going to be uh, opening up other activities for people with low land. It's not particularly clear that in this case, uh, you know, it would be any better um, because of the way the skills are evolving, but certainly a little bit better for sure, because you're, you know, you're sort of completing part of the market is missing. Um, Actually, that relates quite well on Alessandro's question on transfer. Alessandro, the mic is yours. Um, hi, can you hear me? Alessandro, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Hello? Yes, yes, we can. Giacomo, can you hear me? Are yes. You yes, I, we can hear you, but you can't. So, sorry, can somebody tell me if you can hear me or not? Because I'm not hearing you. We anything. can. Yes. Okay. Yes. Don't hear anything. So I'm yes, we up. hear you. <laughs> yes. I, I think your speakers or headphones are off. Okay. Maybe I'll take someone else. Uh, Akiko had a question on aggregate versus uh, aggregate rainfall shock. Um, Akiko? Oh, oh th thank you very much. No, uh, it was on um, individual shock would have an impact on on uh, on household uh, on household. Ah, okay, sorry, you can't hear me. Sounds good. Uh, but, uh, um... Right, uh, Charles Giacomo. So uh, just a thought. So um, of course, this data has been used a lot to study the importance of transfers to provide a yeah. uh, form of insurance. So I was wondering yeah. whether uh, it would make sense to also look maybe separately for the two connected versus less connected households. I mean, frankly, I don't know if this is actually an interesting point because we're looking at rainfall shocks and I presume that by and large, these rainfall shocks will be location specific. So maybe they're going to be common to everyone in a given year. But uh, I also presume that crop choices are going to be very correlated within village. So maybe there is not so much. No, I, mean, I, 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 think, I think you have a very good point. Insuring, uh, and... insuring against rainfall shock, but if there is, maybe actually it would be an interesting point to, to look at. So I think it's actually a very relevant point. Akiko, we, I guess we, you know, grants we get back to you in a second. So let, let me give this answer. Uh, of course, you know the availability of insurance of you know sharing is uh, it's, it's crucial here. So you know we can show that there is no preferred insurance. So under non preferred insurance, I mean this whole mechanism will still work because you have partial insurance, so we still work. Now it really depends though if you actually make the you know the insurance completely endogenous to the problem, and so that is more like in the in the in the realm of things that you know Costas has done with uh, with with, uh, with Melanie and. Uh, Mushrik and Corina. Uh, so they've endogenized that in terms of the migration decision, and they've showed, you know, it actually they showed it at the VDEV, you know, a few, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, that's the 2021 two paper. Um, now we we haven't done that. We sort of take the stand that uh, you know there's imperfect insurance out there, and uh, we go we run for with it. Now on the diversification of activities um, within extended families, uh, which, you know, have sort of done some stuff. I mean, there's truly some correlation, but there's also some idiosyncratic variation, which is a lot of that, what, what we use, essentially. And we actually can show it in terms of also crop choice and, and rainfall. Now, uh, the, the, as you know, the Equisat data don't actually contain, uh, um, let's say, household level relationship. They contain the cast level stuff, which is what Mazzocco and others have used. It turns out, by the way, like, this idea, no, that, that like a bunch of the households don't have a cast in the data, so 25% of them. So I, I I don't remember what they did there because we, you know, this question sometimes comes up and I don't know what to do. Um, so it's hard to construct the networks of sharing. And so Garantz knows about this too, a lot. Uh, and so it would have to be like some sort of village level type of insurance, then we'll have to 
but we're not really we're not tackling that because we're saying well there is part there is partial insurance and in fact the distribution of consumption versus what the model predicts seems to suggest that is that so David was uh, thinking about today I'm thinking more about measurement error but but sort of you know I think both actually play a role. Uh, we're not really modeling that. I think it would be very interesting to introduce this. Um, I mean, David has a really nice paper, actually, you know, thinking about the role of insurance for fertilizer adoption and fertilizer use. Um, uh, we haven't done it. So to be totally, I mean, just to open, <laughs> we, we haven't done it. And uh, we could try to think about it, uh, but we haven't done it. Thank you. And maybe uh, Akiko, yeah. so sorry about yeah. the confusion. Yeah. Uh, to go back yeah. to aggregate it, twin it, It's part of uh, being on Zoom. So, <laughs> hello. so my, my question was uh, about um, this uh, uh, rainfall. So you have, you 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 compute a household specific uh, rainfall, rainfall shock, which would have an impact on, on household's own agricultural activity. But of course, if it is an FE, uh, it might be dependent on, on village level uh, demand, hence on village level rainfall. And so this was a more of a comment or a sure. question. And, 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 and another comment, if I may, is that uh, it's very interesting to see that the, uh, the asymmetry of your results, so that uh, if there is a negative um, a rainfall, the household starts an NFE activity if they can, if they afford it, but if there's a positive rainfall, they will not come back to pure agriculture, and so they are kind of stuck in a in a low productivity um, because so, of this. Uh, so you, so it's uh, yeah. because of this positive, despite of this positive shock, and this seems very intriguing and uh, interesting. Thank you. So these are actually really, I mean, really, really good points. Uh, we, you know, we are in a partial equilibrium setup, so essentially we are not really looking into the feedback loop into the demand, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really a drawback. And in fact, you know, if there are, but a lot of what we're using is, uh, you know, this, this idiosyncratic variation. It means that also within the village, there will be people who actually are not doing very badly, even in a, in a bad case scenario, right? Because there's a lot of idiosyncratic variation. So that is alleviated in a way. It's not. It's this idea of macro shock is a bit of I'm uncomfortable a bit in general with the idea of macro shocks. Uh, and I think this sort of shows that, but we're doing partial equilibrium, so we're not really, you know, looking to the demand and the feedback of that. Um, the, 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 the persistence mechanism, you know, people go back and forth here, right? The, there is one important mechanical reason, and, or, you know, it's not mechanical, it's, like, it's the model reason, is that there is a this learning thing going on and this extra cost that you have to pay if you run, you know, if you don't have the enterprise. So those things are essentially a persistence mechanism, but which we estimate to be, you know, what is in the data essentially. So we actually die, we get very close. In fact, if we use um, if we use the, the distribution of skills that goes up to five, that the one that I'm running now in the background, we, we pin that down very, very precisely. It's like, on top of it, like precisely point whatever it is, 16, I forget now, uh, um, but it's exactly that. So, you know, this mechanism actually is playing a role, this potential learning mechanism. And I, I think it makes some sense that people start and as they uh, as they keep working in, 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 a, in a sector that are which you're less familiar with, they get better. And eventually they will stop getting better. But, but the, you know, the, the, this persistence uh, seems to be reasonable to me. It actually shows up also in the in the reduced form results, by the way. I haven't showed them to you, but you can actually do this uh, sort of persistence type of regression in the reduced form. And it, it, it is it is there, it is in the data. It's not just a feature of the model. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you oh, so no, These are great points. Uh, Giacomo, so Giacomo has uh, kindly offered to right. stay another 15 minutes. Uh, uh, if you have additional question, I copied the link on the Q&A. Uh, and uh, before you hang up, I also wanted to let everybody know that uh, today is the Vox Dev Lead uh, launch event. So there's another webinar if you want more Zoom uh, today uh, at 6.30 Central uh, European time. I'm going to put the link uh, on, the, on the Zoom. Um, thank you so much, everybody, and have a good holiday. Bye, everyone. I'll, I'll move straight onto my Zoom. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Bye. Bye-bye.